Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior. The Capital City Church. Uh, we're going to take a minute to prepare our hearts for worship. Hopefully you've already done some of that uh, before you came, but uh, we're going to do a corporate confession, which is one of the things that we do together. It's good and healthy for us to say some things out loud. Um, it, just as a note, you were probably handed one of these sheets on your way in. That's, I know we're still working on everybody being able to see the screen all the time. Uh, so if you can't see the confession, that's what that's for. Uh, but for just a second, let's catch our breath and be quiet for a minute. I read a quote this week from Charles Spurgeon. I'm paraphrasing it, but it basically said, sometimes two or three minutes of silence in a worship service is worth more than anything for our hearts. Uh, so let's take just a minute. If you want to bow your heads, please close your eyes. See if there's anything you need to confess, whether it's something, some kind of sin, or maybe you want to confess how good God is to you. Let's just be quiet for a minute.
Well, God, it's good to be in your presence. Uh, we don't always remember that. Um, for, for us, uh, weekly worship is a form of recentering. Coming back together in corporate worship is a form of recentering ourselves around your kingdom, around your truth, of reminding ourselves, of reinforming ourselves of how good you are, how much you've done for us, uh, and how we are not independent. We are, in fact, very dependent. We're dependent on each other, but God, most importantly, we're dependent on you. So remind us of that this morning. I pray that today would be convicting, but that it would also be encouraging, God, that we would uh, draw strength from being in a room and singing together and listening to your word together and confessing together for those who in the room with us are of like precious faith. Thank you for Jesus and for the cross because without those things, without Jesus and without his sacrifice on the cross, none of this is possible and none of it matters. Remind us of that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's confess together. Loving God, we confess that at times we do not share in the joy of the resurrection, but are caught in the worries of the world. We confess that we do not always live in the spirit of new life, but remain discontent, grumbling, and anxious. Forgive us for not sharing in the good news. Forgive us when we find it more comfortable to worry and complain than to risk the joy and encouragement and new life in Christ. Thank you for calling us back to you, O oh God, to seek hope and reconciliation, restoration and peace. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. That reality that Christ is alive, sometimes we forget. And that's the reality of salvation. It's the reality of our hope. So just think of that as we sing today on Christ is risen.
Scripture this morning is uh, Psalm 16, 1 through 11, the whole psalm. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. I am no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. If you're an underliner, that's an underliner in your Bible. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul in Sheol, to Sheol. 
or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. And here's another underliner for you. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. As we prepare for this next song, it's called Before the Throne of God. And that Psalm 16 is great in that idea that right, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We'll be spending eternity before his throne. So just think through those things as we sing.
Lord God, in the turmoil of this world and in the challenges that we deal with every day, from raising children to business to relationships, we need to be reminded that you have paid the price on our behalf, that we have life now and forevermore, that this is not the end, no matter what's going on around us. Lord, continue to help us to be reminded of that truth and to set our, our life according to your word. So teach us now through your word of how we should adjust our lives to glorify you for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. Well, welcome to part six of Rhythm of Rest, our series where we've been walking through the idea of Sabbath and what role does it play for New Testament believers. Um, excited about uh, this morning's sermon for a couple reasons, not the least of which is a really fascinating passage of Scripture, 1 Kings 19, uh, verses 1 through 7. Um, and again, you, you should have also received some sermon notes on your way in, so if you're also sitting, uh, and, until we get our speakers hung, you're, you're, you're welcome to supply chain issues, right? You buy things and they don't show up. So until then, you can read along at the top of your sermon notes. That's the passage that we're about to read. 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 7, Ahab told Jezebel, yes, that is a real person, that's not, not just a name that we use, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, meaning dead, by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under the broom tree, or the juniper tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and laid down again. The angel of the Lord came to him a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. This morning we're going to talk about the danger of exhaustion. What does it look like if you have not been observing Sabbath, celebrating Sabbath, li living with this rhythm of rest that God designed us for, um, for whatever reason? What does it look like as you start to approach exhaustion? What does it look like to just be tired? Uh, we could have a testimony service about that, couldn't we? Some of you guys could raise your hand and say, boy, do I have a story about two years ago or 10 years ago or right now, right? What does it look like to just be tired? How do you know uh, when you're too tired? What do you do about it? Uh, what does exhaustion look like in each of our lives? The danger of exhaustion is how do you climb out of the hole that you find yourself in? Because whether you realize it or not, if you are exhausted, you are in a hole. You're in a hole spiritually. You're probably in a hole physically. There's something that you need to climb out of because we were designed to live a certain way by God, uh, not because we're Christian, please hear this, but because we're human. This is a human thing. It's a human condition. Uh, what do you do when exhaustion becomes dangerous, when exhaustion uh, causes you not just to have physical effects, but to have uh, spiritual effects, and even to begin to uh, change some of the ways that you're thinking and make different decisions. As we've said, this is not about giving you a list of commands. 
Because having a list of commands is what caused many of us to rebel against the idea of Sabbath in the first place, right? You can't mow your lawn on the Sabbath and you can't do this on the Sabbath and you don't go to eat because then you're making other people work on the Sabbath and nobody ever really defined the Sabbath. Is it Saturday or is it Sunday or what, right? So this is not about a list of commands. It's about us understanding a principle that's at work and understanding the way that we're wired and really just putting some things on your radar. So we've used this definition week after week. One of the goals being, I'm, I, I'd love to see you kind of memorize it, commit it to memory. Uh, so, and if you have your notes, we're filling in notes here. Sabbath is a regularly scheduled period of, and we spent the last three weeks unpacking these, physical rest, relational reconnection, and spiritual renewal. Now, Sabbath, whether it's a day every week or whether you can catch half days here and there, some weeks that's how it works, whether it's an hour here and there, Sabbath is about three things. We think of physical rest. We also need to understand that Sabbath is about us reconnecting with some people, some people who are important to us, some people who matter to us, our friends and our family, and most especially if you're a believer, and many of us in the room are, if you're a Christian, for many of us, it's connecting with those of like precious faith, of a, of, of a faith of the same kind as ours, this relational reconnection, and then spiritual renewal. And so the question is, what if your tank gets dangerously low? For some of you, what if your tank's empty? What comes next? What do you do next? What does it look like? Charles Spurgeon, you're going to hear quite a bit from Spurgeon today. I don't know why. Well, I know why, because he's my favorite ever. But also, I've just for some reason, I've read a lot of his stuff this week. Uh, he has a lot to say about this subject. He made this statement. I love this. What a great thing. I'm not wearied of the labor, but I'm wearied in it. I'm not wearied of the labor, but I'm wearied in it. You know, it's, it's possible to be exhausted because of something that you're doing. It, it's possible to be tired from something, but that's different than being tired of something. And I think for many of us, part of the reason that we become tired of something is because we were tired from it for so long and we didn't address it. You know why? Because you're Superman. Like, you know that's not true, but in the back of your mind, you kind of think, well, that's for other people. I'm kind of a cut above. I don't know if you noticed, Tim, I'm a little stronger than other people. I, I have a little more endurance. I have a little bit more wisdom. All of that may be true, but you're still human. And I think this is a real, and again, you know, Spurgeon was brilliant. What, what an interesting little play on words. I'm not wearied of the labor, but I'm wearied in the labor. It's okay to be wearied in the labor, but it's dangerous to be wearied of it. And I wonder how many of us are wearied of it. We're thinking about career changes. We're thinking about making some drastic decisions. Please hear this. Don't make big, important decisions when you're tired. There's a running joke in the ministry that every pastor resigns Monday morning. It's kind of true. You know, so you know what? Don't make any important, I don't. You don't make any deported, important decisions on Monday. You know why? Because you're tired and tired people don't make good decisions. The difference between being wearied in it and being wearied of it. I love this quote from Wayne Cordero. Fantastic book. It's called Leading on Empty. Leading on Empty by Wayne Cordero, a pastor out in Hawaii. Rough life, right? He's a pastor in Hawaii who burned out and came back from it, which you don't hear very often. Fantastic story. This is what he says. So good. We don't forget that we're Christians. We forget that we're human. And that one oversight alone can debilitate the potential of our future. Being tired can often lead to making stupid decisions. Importantly, I should say, being tired can often lead us to make stupid decisions about really important things, which is where the stupidity comes from, right? If something's really important, we should take our time and make better decisions, and yet so often when we're tired, we lose the bandwidth to, to have the ability to do that. Please hear this. And not only do you lose the ability to have the bandwidth to make a good decision, listen, lean in, you don't realize that you've lost the ability to have the bandwidth to make a good decision. How many of y'all realized 
have gotten into a moment and you realize you're more tired than you thought you were. When you start resting, you realize. My wife and I had the chance last weekend. We weren't here. We had a, a young couple, friend of our, friends of ours who attend church here, who got married. And so we went out and I went out and did the wedding for them out in Colorado. It's a rough life. <laughs> On the side of a mountain, it was pretty fantastic. And, and I honestly felt pretty fine. But when we got in the car to leave, we, we didn't take the kids. We just made it a long weekend for the two of us. When we got in the car and drove away, I went, Oh, I was more tired than I thought I was. It's possible you are too. We don't make good decisions. We often, it often leads to stupid decisions. Listen, please hear this. And there's this, there's this undercurrent that I've heard for 30 years in ministry, and it's 100% true. I'm telling you what's true in ministry, but I think it's true for more than just ministry. When you get exhausted, when you get really tired, and, and this is usually men talking to men, okay, pastors talking to pastors, when you get really tired, the danger is that you're going to do something stupid as it relates to money or sex. Money or sex. That's always going to be the weak spot. That's always going to be the blind spot. And I, I said about Wayne Cordero, it's fascinating that he burned out and he came back because he, he's one of the, the small minority of people who burned out and didn't do something stupid in either of those things. And he climbed back. Please hear this. This is the theme of that book. He climbed back slowly because that's the only way you can climb back from exhaustion. It's, it's, it's steady, small deposits. What do those deposits look like? Sabbath. Just week after week. And finding that new rhythm and realizing that, yes, I'm exhausted, but also every week I feel a little bit better. I practice this. I observe it, not just because I'm tired, but because I need to be reminded that I can't do everything, that I have limits. Here's the thing. You can trust that God's going to continually provide supernatural rescue for you. You can. And I'm telling you, I have friends. I've heard this from spiritual people, from people who love God, and they just live out at the bleeding edge. And I've heard them say more than once, I just go all the way to the edge and I trust that God's supernatural provision is going to meet me there and take, I, I, I schedule out to the edge, I, I make commitments out to the edge, and I trust that God's going to meet me there. And, and you know, if you disagree with this, I, I'm not saying I'm right. It's just my turn to talk, right? Maybe we could grab, grab coffee and discuss it. I'm just asking you a simple question. If our plan is always to go all the way out to the bleeding edge, you guys are getting nervous right now, aren't you? Why? Because I'm out on the edge. If our plan is always to go out on the edge and trust that God's going to meet us there, is that a wise plan? Has God called us to live with wisdom? I'm just asking questions. Sometimes helpful questions are good for us, right? Like if God calls you to get out of the boat and walk on water, then get out of the boat and walk on water. But if he didn't, where are your floaties? Is it wise for us to always trust that God's going to continually provide supernatural rescue for us? I don't know. So the context for this passage, Ahab, if you remember, after Solomon, you get the, the in, in the Old Testament, you have the nation of Israel, and then it splits into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And Ahab was a very powerful political ruler. Now, that doesn't mean he was godly, but he had political power. He was a king in, northern, in the northern kingdom of Israel. He was king somewhere around between 874 B.C. and 853 B.C. He marries a woman named Jezebel, who is a princess from Tyre, and, but she did not worship the God of the Bible. She did not worship the God of the universe. She worshiped a lot of gods, and those gods were called Baal. And you see this B-A-A-L. You see it continually when you read through the Old Testament. She's the one that brought in, and this is interesting. Listen, Baal was a Phoenician god of fertility. It's an interesting idea. It plays into this story. So now you've got, you've got Ahab who marries Jezebel, and she wants to worship. Forget about this other god you guys have been worshiping. I want to worship the gods that I'm bringing with me in my suitcase, right? So Ahab says, sure, go ahead, knock yourself out. 
Well, Elijah, in the meantime, is off to the east, kind of sequestered in a little bit more rural area. So they were still worshiping the God of the Bible. And Elijah shows up in the courts of Ahab and can't believe what he's seeing, can't believe what he's hearing. He's appalled by the syncretism that they're, that they're practicing. He appears suddenly in Ahab's court to announce, by the way, in the name of Yahweh, the God of the Bible, he announces in the name of Yahweh, which went over in that room like a lead balloon, right? He announces in the name of Yahweh that there was gonna be a paralyzing drought. There's a drought coming. Then Elijah performs in 1 Kings 18, which I would, I, we're going to preach through the life of Elijah at some point. And I look forward to this story because the, in 1 Kings 18, for me, it's one of the most significant miracles. It's one of the most dynamic miracles in the Old Testament, right? And there are a lot of miracles there. They have this showdown between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. You remember this story? They go up on the mountain and he says, look, we're both going to make an altar. We're both going to sacrifice some animals and we're going to see which God sends fire down from heaven. You remember this story? So and he tells the prophets of Baal, you go first. I'll let you guys go first. So they do the thing, right? They build an altar and they sacrifice all these animals. They lay them on the altar and they start crying out to God and they, they're up to not to God, to Baal. They're crying out to their God, Baal, all day, right? Send down fire, send down fire. They start cutting themselves. Send down fire, nothing happens. Meanwhile, Elijah's over here having some fun, going, is, is your God asleep? You should go back and read it. It's a fascinating story, right? Is your God asleep? He actually says, maybe he's in the bathroom. I'm telling you, the Old Testament's really fascinating. You should read it. What's going on? Where's your God? And of course, nothing happens. So then it's Elijah's turn, and he tells him to bring in water. He's got his altar. He's got his animals. He has them dig a trench around it. He tells them to bring in water, soak the whole thing. So they did. He said, bring in some more water. And they brought in more. And they just kept bringing in water until not only everything was soaked, but the trench was full of water around it. And he steps back and he says, God, it's time for you. It's time for you to show up and be the God that you are. You need to leave no question in anyone's mind who is the God of the universe. Everybody stand back. What happens? Here comes the fire. Here comes the fire. Totally takes care of this entire, what, what a moment, right? This is better than what you're going to see in the movies. I mean, this is amazing. So then what does he do? He does this very Old Testament thing. Which, by the way, the law prescribed that if you were leading others to worship another god, you experienced the death penalty. So they, he gathers up these prophets of Baal, and they take them down by the river. They put them to death. You say, Tim, I don't like that. Well, God didn't ask us. That's just what's in there. I don't know what to tell you. We can read it together and, I guess, wring our hands. But that's what happened. God's serious about sharing his glory with anyone. And he's serious about those of us who lead others astray from that. Well, then that's where we step into these verses. Ahab goes and tells Jezebel, the queen, you're not going to believe what Elijah did. We had this showdown. We lost. Elijah's God won. And then he killed all the prophets that we brought in. All those prophets of Baal who were leading us to worship this other, our God that we believe in, they're all dead now. Ahab told Jezebel, verse 1, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. By the way, she wasn't the least bit impressed. That whole story I just told you, when she heard it, she was like, okay, whatever. He's an obstacle. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods, by the way, time out. You know what just went through my crazy head? Some of you maybe even in light of some of what we've seen this week in the news. You're trying to convince someone of something. I'm telling you, it's possible to call down fire from heaven and they're still not convinced. Because sometimes being convinced or not convinced is more about my heart than it is about what I see or what I hear. We'll come back to that. 
Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, which by the way is kind of a funny thing to say, your gods couldn't do anything, <laughs> right? So may they do to me, you know, the way that they took action yesterday, which is to say not at all. So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. In other words, you leave within 24 hours. This time tomorrow is your deadline. And if you're still here, you're going to be as dead as they are. Then he was afraid. Elijah was afraid. You know what else? The king was probably afraid. You know why? Because everybody was afraid of Jezebel. Everybody was afraid of her. And Elijah rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. I want to talk about four peculiarities. I didn't know what, else, what other word to use. Four peculiarities of exhaustion because we've all been exhausted. Some of us are exhausted right now. But I want, to, I want to give you four anchors that you can put into it that we see right here in this story. Four anchors that will remind us how exhaustion can fool us. How can it distract us? How can it divide us? Four peculiarities of exhaustion. Number one is, which is what we just read, it often comes when we are running from something. Exhaustion often runs when we're running from something. Maybe to you, because I know it's true for me, the most significant thing that I think about when I read this passage in 1 Kings 19, I also think about what just happened in 1 Kings 18. Imagine with me that you were Elijah and you had been there in that moment when they weren't able to call down the fire and you did. Would you have walked out of there 10 feet tall and bulletproof? I think maybe we might have. I think we may have walked out in the confidence of God going, we have nothing to fear. That's not what we see. If it often comes, exhaustion often comes when we are running from something. Elijah had enough fear of God to call down fire. The problem is he also had fear of Jezebel. And that overwhelmed him. This is in your notes. Running on fear or insecurity is not the same as running on energy. This is an entire sermon which we don't have time to preach. So I'm just going to give you this in passing, okay? Elijah ran about 90 miles to Beersheba. He literally ran out of the northern kingdom and he ran to another country. He ran out of the northern kingdom into the southern kingdom because he was afraid. How many of you, listen, how many of you, how many of us are running so hard and so fast and we think we still have energy to burn and the truth is we're just powered by insecurity. We're powered by a fear of something happening or a fear of something not happening. What if they don't think I'm successful? What if I don't go further than my parents did? What if the truth comes out? What if people find out I'm a fraud? What, I mean, I'm not trying to get too, you know, analytical on you. But this, we're human. And sometimes you think you have a limitless well of energy when the truth is you're not being powered by energy that comes from rest and health. Some of us are being powered by insecurity. And it will power you for a long time. Please hear me. It also won't let you rest. Look me in the eye. You know why? Because idols don't let you rest. That's the point of an idol. An idol is not going to let you rest. An idol doesn't say... Take a break. An idol says more, more, more. Wayne Cordero in this book, Leading on Empty, says sometimes the road to success and the road to a nervous breakdown are one and the same. Wow. Sometimes the road to success and the road to a nervous breakdown are one and the same. In Colossians 3.15, Paul says, let the peace of Christ do what? What does it say? Say it out loud. Rule. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It literally means let the peace of Christ reign as a king. Can I just ask you a question? Do you let the peace of Christ reign as a king? What's reigning as a king in your heart? Is it insecurity? Is it fear? Or is it the peace of Christ to which indeed you are called in one body and be thankful? 
King Saul, who was the first king of Israel, who started off good and wound up bad, right? He's approached by Samuel at the end, the prophet Samuel, and Samuel comes to him and says, you're no longer going to be king. And this is what Saul said in response. I have sinned, please hear this, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, here we go, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You can either fear God or you can fear people. But if you try to do both, there's going to come friction and something's going to win out. Either you're going to ignore God because your fear of people is too great or you're going to learn to ignore people because your fear of God is too great. This is the tension that you and I have to live in. What will they say? What will they think if I'm different? What if I don't succeed? These are fear of man questions. We have to be careful. It often comes we're running from something. Number two, the second peculiarity of exhaustion. Exhaustion can catch you off guard. Kind of already talked about this. He was coming off a major spiritual victory. Please hear me. When you come down off the mountain, be ready. Because sometimes that's when you're the most vulnerable precisely because you think you aren't. He was likely exhausted before he started running. Please hear this. This is so big. Jezebel probably wanted to embarrass him and discredit God. You may have called down fire from the mountain, but if I speak, you flee. I'm going to show everyone who was watching the de debacle, you know, that happened on the mountain. I'm going to show them who's really in charge. I speak and you jump. And because he was exhausted, he fell for it. He played into her hands. She wanted to embarrass him and discredit God. She probably didn't want to kill him. Why? Because if you want to kill someone, you don't send them a 24-hour warning, do you? Especially if you're the queen. You just send somebody to kill them. That's not what this was about. It was a power play. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul said, Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. This is an entire another sermon. It is. Listen. We need to be really careful in guarding our hearts. Especially when things are going well for us spiritually. Because we have a tendency as humans to look down our nose at other people's sins. I told you it was a whole another sermon. You think it's not related, but it is. Because we find something that someone else is doing and we think something like, well, I don't do that. So now it's time to be holier than thou. You know why? Because we're no good at being holy. So a cheap substitute is to be holier than thou. Welcome to social media. Oh, you did that? Let me pile on. Really? You may not, look me in the eye. You may not ever come back, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You may not be guilty of that sin, but you're guilty of sin. And before we start strutting around like roosters, we need to catch our breath and take heed lest we fall. We come off the mountaintop thinking we're something big. Careful. Take heed. I love in Galatians 6, 1, Paul says, brothers, if any of you are caught in a trespass, Listen, listen to the words. You who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Each of you looking to yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Someone's caught in a trespass. Let's send the spiritual people to restore them. How do we know they're spiritual? They remember that they're also sinners. Well, that just eliminated a lot of what we see on social media, right? Yes exactly my point. We're not concerned with restoration. We're concerned with piling on. Why? Because it makes us feel good to pretend to be holy. We have to be careful with this. In the difficult journey to holiness, don't settle for the sweet but deadly imitation of being holier than thou. Verse 4, we keep reading. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came, sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die 
He asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Exhaustion distorts your perspective, tempting, tempting you to violate your beliefs. When you get tired, there starts to be a temptation to violate your beliefs, and you won't even realize that it's in front of you. Or you'll realize it after it's too late. Did Elijah really believe that being suicidal was okay? No. No. How do you pray that prayer coming out of 1 Kings 18? How do you do that? Well, the victory at Mount Carmel was far behind him. It was just a few days prior. Genesis 25, so interesting. We don't have time to unpack it. I put this in your notes. Genesis 25 uh, is the story of when Esau sold his birthright to Jacob, which is a pivotal story, not just in the, in the books of the Old Testament, the stories of the Old Testament. I'm telling you, this plays into the Middle East today and the nations that are there today. It all came from this. Once when, and remember, in, in their society, the firstborn had this birthright. And Esau was the firstborn. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field. He was exhausted. How many times have you read this passage and you, you missed that? He came in and he was exhausted. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew. Why? Because I am exhausted. How many times have we heard that he was exhausted now? You think it was significant? Yeah, I think it's a significant part of the story. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which sounds like the word red in Hebrew. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Dude, you're not about to die. You're just tired and hungry. And you sold your birthright. You made a stupid decision. Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him, sold his birthright to Jacob. How many of us have sold a birthright? Just because we were exhausted. Just because we were tired. Verse 5, we're finished. He lay down, slept under a broom tree. Behold, an angel touched him and said to him, what does it say? Everybody say it out loud. Listen, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just sit down and have a meal. And all God's people said, Amen. that's right. Also, take a nap. <laughs> Very spiritual person said that out loud. Take a nap and have a meal. Why? It's not about being spiritual. It's about being human. It's the way you were built. It's the way we're wired. Exhaustion often has a deceptively simple solution. It's in your notes. The most spiritual thing Elijah could do was take a nap and eat. When we're restless and driven, it reveals a lack of contentment. Isn't this really what this is about? We have a lack of contentment, which is why we're driven. And we need to go, 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 and we can't take a break. We can't stop. We can't unplug. We feel guilty because we're not there yet. What does it look like to have contentment? Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have, what does it say? Food and clothing. With these we'll be content. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. I need the newer car and the bigger house and the more successful business and I need the title and I need the private office or I need the bigger office or I need the office with the bathroom in it, right? I need, I, I've got to keep climbing the ladder. And Paul says, actually, bring it back to the simplicity. You need food and clothing, a place to lay your head. What would it look like to just be content with those things? I want to close with this uh, quote from Spurgeon. It's a little longer. I love this quote. It's so good. In the long run, we shall do more by sometimes doing less. By the way, he, he, this was written to a group of pastoral students. But it's true for all of us. In the long run, we shall do more by sometimes doing less. While we were in this tabernacle, he's talking about our bodies, while we are in this tabernacle, we must every now and then cry, what's the word? Halt. Stop! We must every now and then cry halt and serve the Lord by, listen to this, this is so good, holy inaction and consecrated leisure. Boy, Isaac, it's kind of weird. You, got, you, you refused to go with us and do the thing all day and you said that you guys were just staying at home and being quiet? What are you doing? Are you guys just lazy? 
Why are you so different from everyone? What are you doing? Are you just lazy? We're practicing holy inaction and consecrated leisure. <laughs> Isn't that a great answer? Circle it and take it home with you. Memorize it. Put it in your phone so that when someone asks, are, are, can you do this? I told you a couple weeks ago, this, the answer is to say, no, we have plans. Really, what do you have planned? To practice holy inaction and consecrated leisure. By the way, he wasn't tongue-in-cheek when he wrote this. He was just as serious as he could be. The point is, we don't think of inaction as holy, and we don't think of leisure as consecrated. That's his point. They are. This is so good. Let no tender conscience doubt the lawfulness of going out of harness for a while. Do you hear it? The imagery of a horse or an oxen go out of harness. You, we're not working all the time. Let no tender conscience doubt the lawfulness of going out of harness for a while, but learn from the experience of others the necessity and duty of taking timely rest. Learn from the experience of others. How about from the experience of Elijah? Can you learn from the experience of Elijah? Listen. If Elijah needed to take a break, do you? If it, was, if it was okay for him to unplug and recharge, is it okay for you to do it? Are you more spiritual than him? Are you more godly than him? Are you stronger than him? Probably not. So what do you do? How do you climb out of this? I actually want to do something different right now. I want to invite Haley Wynn to come uh, on the stage here. Uh, Haley is a licensed clinical social worker uh, with Restored Counseling, good friend. Um, some of you know her because her and her husband, Ryan, uh, are in charge of our mentoring ministry. And so uh, one of the things that Haley uh, does is really understands not, she's gonna be helping us this summer as we walk through uh, trauma-informed care and how do we be sure that we're keeping everyone safe in, in all ministry environments. But also we've had some great conversations just about what does it look like to blend, and you guys hang on because some of you aren't gonna like this and that's okay. Uh, what does it look like to blend spirituality with mental health? What does it look like to approach mental health from a biblical perspective, from a godly perspective? So I thought I would ask you a couple questions because we had a conversation a few weeks ago over coffee and it was fantastic. And I told her, you need to say that to our, they need to hear you say that. So the first one is, how do I know, how do any of us know if we're burned out or if we're just tired? Like where do you draw the line? How do you know the difference? Yeah, so I would say that the simple answer to that is if you're just tired and you're experiencing fatigue, then that's going to be more short-lived, right? And so um, you're going to put some relief measures in place, and then you're going to start to feel better. Mm -hmm. Versus burnout, when you're really experiencing burnout, that's going to be prolonged, and it's going to be harder to overcome. So a really good example of that is I have a two-month-old right now, um, and as most of us know, that means uh, sleepless nights. Wait, wait, nights. are you tired? <laughs> I did have coffee. I, I did have coffee this morning. But um, so that means more sleepless nights, right? And so when that happens, um, I might be showing some similar symptoms of burnout, right? I might feel really exhausted. I might not feel myself. Um, but a really good nap, a long shower, a tag out from my husband like he's doing right now, um, those are going to be things that start to make me feel better. Okay. With burnout, that's not the case. With burnout, I'm going to feel... Um, like there's no way out, like no matter what kind of solution or suggestion comes up, it just doesn't good. feel like it's enough. That's good. And I think it's important to note also, like I said earlier, if, if you're not burned out, you're just tired and you like you rest, you get those moments, it doesn't immediately shoot you all the way back up to full. It's, it, it's a slow deposit. So you kind of have to monitor, okay, well that didn't totally fix the problem, but did it help? It didn't, it didn't, you know, refill your tank all the way to full, but did it put some fuel back in your tank? So uh, what are the core symptoms of burnout? So we're going to look at a few different things with burnout. We want to look at some physical symptoms, some emotional symptoms, and some behavioral symptoms. And so a few physical symptoms might be like a change in appetite or sleep, more headaches, um, just chronic exhaustion that doesn't want to go away. Emotional symptoms might be like, I have a sense of failure, I have a lack of motivation, or just I'm more negative, kind of a negative Nancy. 
Um, sorry if your name's Nancy. <laughs> Not you. Yeah. We're talking about the other names. Yeah, right, right. Um, some behavioral changes you might see could include like increased procrastination more than normal. Um, you're avoiding things. You have a, a sense of, I already talked about sense of failure. Um, and then also you're just taking your anger and frustration out on people around you. And don't you think part of the subtlety is you don't connect that that's why I can't sleep or that's why my appetite's gone. Or I, I know for me in the past, it's been, this is related to that over there. And I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't realize it. And then I'm exhausted. So my perspective is a little cloudy right. up front. And that's the tricky thing with burnout because it builds up over time. It's kind of gradual. Mm -hmm. And so you don't actually often realize when you're in burnout. Okay. So what's the process or what's the role of biblical counseling in the discipleship process? Now, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, this is a really important question because not all counseling is biblical counseling. You need to understand that. And I recommend to folks all the time, I'm about to tell you, I have someone that I go see at Christ First Counseling uh, regularly. And, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. But we need to be really particular about who we're going to talk to. So what's, how does, like, we're, we, everybody here may think, well, I'm trying to be a disciple. I'm not sure about the counseling thing. They actually can go together. Tell us how. Absolutely. And one thing I do want to clarify is that burnout is not a mental health condition. Okay. Right? Good. And so Thank you. everyone in here is susceptible of burnout because we're human. And so I do think that that's important to that's clarify. Really important. But counseling can be beneficial to help you with burnout. So I actually have an image. Um, let's scoot over here. And so when I see a client for the first time, I like to walk them through kind of this picture of what it looks like to, to partner with a biblical counselor to go through the process of healing and how that can benefit your spiritual walk. And so we have this first little orange circle on the inside, and I like to call that your spirit-led self. And simply, your spirit-led self is when God was knitting you, he had certain qualities and attributes that he intended you to have to be the best version of yourself. Uh, but what happens is we are then, we enter this sinful and broken world. And sometimes right from the get-go, right, we start experiencing these fractures. Right. Um, and these little fractures could be something like a traumatic experience or something small, like dad never shows up because he works all the time or a mistake that you made. But those fractures, in order to um, experience those, we kind of start making adaptions, and we call that our adaptive self. And usually you get so comfortable with those adaptions that we start operating out of what we call the false self. So we no longer are looking the way that God intended us to look, and we start operating out of the sense of false self. And so the answer here isn't to move backwards. And I think that's the thing that deters people from biblical counseling, um, is we think, well, I don't, need to, I don't need to deal with that. That's in the past, or it's, I can't change it. But the reality is, is we want to be able to acknowledge and process those things because that's going to allow us to access what we call a redeemed self. And when you think about um, the Sabbath, the Sabbath helps us operate out of redeemed self while burnout keeps us stuck in false self. Mm. And so that's what that image means. And just to expand on that just a little bit more, um, some of us might not actually know that we're living in false self. And that's the problem with burnout, right? It's because again, it, goes over your head you don't realize it and so think of it this way if you're out of shape because your hip hurts then you're gonna go see a doctor to figure out hey why can't I exercise the way that I need to the way that I want to and then they're most likely gonna diagnose you with something give you treatment or they might just say hey do some stretches here's what you need to do to get back in shape and counseling is the same way but for your mental and emotional health which is really important. I love the example of you, you, counseling's like when your hip hurts, you go see a doctor. Probably when you're, if your hip really hurts, you shouldn't self-diagnose, okay? Because when you go see a doctor, they may say, well, the reason your hip hurts is because your knee's out of whack or you have a problem with your ankle and you're gonna go, oh, I didn't connect those things. And obviously, just like going to see a doctor, you need to go see a good one. You need to go see the right one. So the last question I would ask you is, like, why should we listen to this? Because I'm a little secret for you, because I do this all the time. They don't all think they should do this. <laughs> Some people sit and think, oh, that's for everybody else. But we should at least all ask a question of ourselves. We should at least think through this. Why, why should we all at least be brave enough to ask the question, is this something I should think about? 
I think the reality is whether you've heard this for the first time or this is a broken record, um, clarity does not produce change. And Say that's that how again. I it. Clarity does not produce change. And so even though you know it, it might not actually mean that you're changing your life and it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to have somebody help you access that change. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It, and I would add in, uh, one of the great things about biblical counseling is you create a rhythm of really accountability where you're going to show up and you're going to be asked, did you do what we talked about you were going to do? And uh, so I, I want to say this, uh, two things. First of all, uh, I go see Corey Schlipp uh, regularly. He's the head of Christ First Counseling's good friend. Um, I, don't, I don't understand the stigma behind counseling. I, I never really have. And let me tell you why. This is going to sound weird. Listen because I'm a car guy. You have, that, that has no relation. Here's what I know. If you never do anything to your car and you just drive it like crazy until it starts making funny noises, you're in trouble. And that was a pretty dumb way to treat your car. What do you do? You go get your oil changed. Even if you don't want to. Even if you grumble about it. You understand that this is a finely tuned valuable machine and you have to perform maintenance in order to keep it running the way that it should run to me it's always been like that i'm going to go talk to corey not because i have some big huge thing that i need to sort through but sometimes just because I, hey i'm hearing a little noise here i just want to do a double check i want to get somebody else's perspective the second thing i want to say is this we actually have scholarships if you think i can't afford to go talk to someone we actually have scholarships available so Haley's going to be down here now. Haley can't counsel any of you because that's not what she does. Uh, and she can explain more about that. She really works with kids. And so, uh, but she will be happy to talk with you about where you can go. There are a couple of different options. There's Restored, there's Christ First, there's many. And we would love to help you. If you want to talk about a scholarship, you come talk to me or you go talk to Tom Bryan. He's one of our elders. He's right down here. We already provide them for others and we would be happy to provide it for you as well. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the ways that you uh, provide for us and you um, love us. Uh, you love us in ways that we don't understand. You love us in ways that we don't always see, but you're always good to us and you always want us to be healthy and whole. And so for some of us in here, I just pray that you'd give us courage to look in the mirror and ask some hard questions not because we're built guilty or evil or we've done anything wrong, but just because we're tired and we need to return to your design for us. Uh, we don't know how you're going to lead us to answer those questions. And you may lead us to have someone to help us provide a healthy answer. But it's always good to ask, how's my soul? How's my soul? Give us the courage to ask that question and the wisdom to answer it well and to seek the counsel of others as we answer it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Please stand with us. <clears throat>
guys really are the best choir in Topeka. We hope that you've had um, an edifying time being with us this morning. Uh, if you have any questions about anything that you've heard, I'm going to be hanging around right down front. Tom is down here as well. Haley will be down here. Uh, don't be afraid to come and talk to us, please. Uh, we would love to share with you and listen to you, whatever the case may be. So our benediction this morning, actually, normally I pull it out of a passage that we read during the sermon. Uh, this morning it's going to feel kind of random. It's 2 Corinthians 13. But I read it this week in my quiet time. And when I read these verses, I thought, man, that's just a custom-made Benediction. You don't even have to change anything. Like here it is. It's verses 11 through 14 of 2 Corinthians 13. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thanks for coming. You're dismissed. Have a great week.